So thanks, Kim, for having me here and the organizers. Um, so I'm going to talk over the next probably 20 minutes or hopefully less about PET, which I know there's a lot of excitement about. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what is PET, and I'm, I'm going to try not to get too technical. But I think, you know, again, there are a lot of misconceptions about what is PET and what it can do, how it works, things like that. So I do, you know, want to just mention a little bit of science behind it. Um, I will talk about what could PET tell us, so what are kind of, what's the promise of PET. And then I'll give a few examples and kind of review the evidence, hopefully pretty concisely. So um, this is a nice slide showing kind of the evolution of technology over the past over 40 years, and you can see from left to right in terms of CT and, and PET both, um, the resolution has gotten a lot better over the years, and then it's only really the last maybe 10 or 15 years where it's gotten to the point where we can start to be able to use it uh, for different purposes. So what are the potential advantages of PET CT over just, say, CT alone or other imaging? And I think the advantages are really that it marries both structure and function. So structure is in terms of the CT having a very high spatial resolution, being able to look at different uh, types of tissues, bone, fat, air, other things like that. And then the PET on top of that adds the function. So we can characterize lesions, you know, how are they, say, taking up sugar or doing other types of things depending on what kind of tracer you're using. And then that may allow you to better detect uh, lesions or at least to maybe better separate out, separate out which lesions are lesions to be worried about and which lesions are lesions you should not be worried about. So this is a nice slide kind of showing that marriage. So on the top uh, row you have a PET scan and it's black and white. You'll notice you have a CT in the middle row. Um, and these are different views, kind of a frontal view, a side view, and then a, the last column is a patient lying on his or her back uh, with their belly button pointing towards the ceiling. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, the PET CT marriage, you know, so you first take the, they first take the PET scan um, and they colorize it, um, and then they overlay the, uh, the CT on top, and that gives a lot more information than just one or another alone, and then they can kind of play with the different features uh, back and forth. Um, so, um, so, so on the topic of PET being kind of a functional type of an imaging, um, what, what types of things are unique to cancer? What, how, how does cancer function different from normal cells? And so this is a, this is a classic slide, um, first published by Hanahan and Weinberg in 2000, I believe, that's now been updated in 2011. And these are showing some, some kind of cardinal features of cancer or hallmarks of cancer biology. Um, so these are things like deregulating cellular energetics. So, so that means cancer takes up glucose more than normal tissues, um, things like evading growth suppressors, um, you know, other things inducing angiogenesis, which we all know is very important in, uh, in kidney cancer, and then sustaining proliferative signaling, and of course avoiding immune destruction, which is being increasingly recognized now as important in kidney cancer. So uh, since, since I think especially FDG PET is so misconstrued, I do want to just talk about a few basic, uh, basic principles. Um, and so to do that, I'll have to talk about a little science. But also to note, when most people say PET, they don't, they don't say FDG PET, they don't say floating, sodium fluoride PET or some other kind of PET. They just say PET. And usually what they mean is FDG PET, which is basically looking at sugar and how the tumor takes up sugar. And so this is a kind of a cartoon that has a lot of science in it. Um, but basically, you can break this down very simply. Um, what it amounts to is what you're looking at is a cell membrane, so, so of a, say a cancer cell. There are glucose transporters in that cell membrane. So sugar flows from a, a gradient you know, into the cell. Um, and what's unique to cancer cells is the cancer cell is relatively inefficient. So it doesn't go towards that bottom pathway that's in the mitochondrion. Um, it just kind of cycles back and forth. And so in doing so, it takes up a lot of sugar relative to normal cells. And we could take advantage of that with FDG PET imaging. Um, so this is a slide showing FDG, so kind of a, a sugar-like substance flowing through the same sugar transporter that, that sugar would. Um, and normally, sugar, uh, these, these arrows here, uh, let's see if I can point them out. These arrows here are showing different kind of enzymes that convert the sugar into all different types of things. Um, 
But the cell can't get rid of the FDG, so it can't flow back out. It also can't flow down into other pathways. So that FDG is then trapped, and we can take advantage of that to do imaging. And so what we see is this, uh, the, this FDG that's trapped in cells. Um, but this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because you can imagine if a patient has one or several tumors in their body, what are you really looking at? Are you looking at all of the tumors? How do you, how do you kind of quantify that? Um, and so what is commonly used is an SUV max, it's called. And that's, uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry to have to, to mention these kind of technical terms, but that is one voxel. And a voxel is like a pixel. So a pixel is, is two-dimensional. It's a square. A voxel is three-dimensional. It's a cube. And so it's the cube in the tumor that has the brightest intensity. So what you're doing then is you're boiling this whole tumor down to one little point that's the very brightest spot. Um, and that's the most common measurement called SUV max. There are other ways of, of looking at this. Um, so, so one of my colleagues at Wisconsin likes to say images are just more than one number. In fact, they're very complex. The data that comes out of these PET scans is just enormous. And so one of the reasons why we use SUV max is it's very nice. You have one point that you boil everything down to. But the disadvantage of that is you don't really capture all of the features of this this lesion. So think about this lesion. You know, it may have spots that are brighter than others. It may have um, different nests of cells that are behaving differently. You know, some are good, some are bad for other, uh, lack of a better way to kind of explain it. So there have been other ways of kind of quantifying and describing what you get when you get a PET scan. So one of those is SUV peak, where you actually take some diameter around the the brightest voxel, so the SUV max, so like one centimeter around, and you quantify that. You can also quantify the whole thing in terms of the total uh, brightness, say, uh, and you can do measurements. So this is a list you know, of just all kinds of possibilities, just showing that SUV max is, is what is commonly used. And if your oncologist or, or other doctor were to get a PET scan, chances are what would be in the report is an SUV max. It would say this is, this is something that looks like a tumor here. And this is its SUV max, it's you know, seven or, or whatever it is. Um, for now, these other measurements are being looked at for research purposes, but aren't really, aren't really a standard of care. But as, as bioinformatics gets better and things like that, I think that the field of, of pet research may move to looking at some of these other, other things because they may be more important and may not, uh, you know, I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, may better describe the tumor burden in the patient's body than just boiling each tumor down to one little point. So, so if you look up in, in NCCN guidelines or you look in, in different uh, guidelines and recommendations, Medi Medicare's recommendations, for example, uh, they do not routinely mention the use of PET scans in kidney cancer. And so these are some of the reasons why. Uh, most PET tracers, including FDG, are eliminated by the kidneys. So you have you know, what you can see is the FDG kind of flowing down the tract um, from the kidney into the bladder and so on and so forth out the body. Um, also, early investigations seem to indicate that primary kidney tumors, so tumors within the kidney, had relatively low sugar uptake. So it didn't seem to be kind of useful there. So FDG PET didn't really seem to add a lot to just conventional CT imaging, for example, for looking at renal masses. But when they kept looking at it, it looked like FDG PET performed a little bit better for detection of distant metastases. So it was fairly uh, specific, meaning that if it, was a, if it was a positive FDG PET, you could kind of believe that, that result. So uh, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what FDG PET could tell us. And I'm going to argue a lot of this is, is still a, a work in progress, but I think there's a lot of hope um, as, the, as the technology advances and maybe new tracers are, are used. Um, we could have some, some real use from PET. So the first area where I think uh, PET may be useful is better characterization of small renal masses. Um, so basically differentiating malign malignant from benign small renal masses. And I, I, I'm sorry, I missed Dr. Smith's talk. Did she talk about, about gerontuximab? Or? No. Okay. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about what's you know, maybe the most promising tracer gerontuximab. Um, the second area where I think uh, PET could maybe tell us something useful is 
we know that there are patients at high risk of recurrence, and we know that because of different features when Dr. Rampersad takes them to surgery, when he looks in the pathology, may make them more likely to recur. So if they're T3, T4, if, you know, if they have other high grade, you know, those kinds of things. We think those patients are, are probably more likely to recur, but we can't see the disease on our conventional imaging. So maybe we could see that better on PET. And then the key is if we see it, hopefully we can also treat it and have good tools that, to treat it to, to improve outcomes for patients. And so I think it's important to note both of those things have to be true. Um, and then the third thing, which is something that's near and dear to my heart, is in patients with metastatic kidney cancer, can we improve prognostication um, or prediction? So prognosticating how long patients may live, which is important for a lot of, a lot of things, um, but also predicting when therapies might work or or even just treatment monitoring, are, are treatments working or not? Um, current prognostication systems, as I imagine was discussed this morning, rely really on clinical factors. So things like laboratory values, the patient's performance status, um, but maybe PET should be in there. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of the data around that. The other problem is that standard radiographic methods, so CT, are a little bit problematic in kidney cancer. Um, Without getting into it too much, there are um, some situations where we see that the tumor is growing on CT scans, and so conventional research methods of measuring the tumors might say, this patient is progressing, when in fact the tumors are changing in their characteristics of taking up um, different, uh, different IV contrasts, and we think, no, maybe they're dying in the middle or, or something like that. Um, and there are, other, there are other scenarios where we can't where we can't really evaluate patients. So for example, a patient who has tumors only in the bone, tumors in the bone are very hard to measure and hard to kind of quantify. So maybe that's a situation where PET could be useful over CT or say, say bone scan. So without further ado, I'll get into the first um, one of these, which is characterization of small renal masses. And this is, I think, one of the most exciting um, uses of PET. So this is uh, gerontuximab, so CG250, uh, which is labeled with iodine. Um, so this is a monoclonal antibody, so an antibody that recognizes what's called carbonic anhydrase 9 on the cell membrane of specifically clear cell kidney cancer. So keeping in mind there are other histologies or types or flavors of kidney cancer. It's you know, specific for clear cell kidney cancers. And so keep in mind that in terms of indeterminate renal masses, if you think about it, about half are clear cell renal cancer, but then the other half are made up of some with limited malignant potential, so things that we would worry less about, papillary and chromophobe, histologic types, but also benign tumors, oncocytoma. So there is a concern for overtreatment of small renal masses specifically, some renal masses that are greater than, or sorry, less than or equal to four centimeters. So we know that patients who have uh, you know, especially uh, full nephrectomy or even partial nephrectomy are at risk for chronic kidney disease and then uh, for cardiovascular disease. So maybe we can differentiate um, amongst these different categories of indeterminate renal masses with something like gerontuximab. And so again, I don't want to bore you with too much biology, but this is, I think, a nice cartoon just showing one of the pathways that's really central in kidney cancers, and that's uh, the von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor gene. So what you can see on the left here is that in conditions where there's normal oxygen levels in the tissue, the VHL, von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor, basically marks this thing called the HIF1-alpha, hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha, for degradation, and it's degraded. Now, in clear cell kidney cancer, what happens is in a large majority of cases, that VHL is inactivated for some reason, maybe a mutation. Um, as a consequence, it doesn't inactivate that HIF1-alpha. That goes to the nucleus of the cell and sets off this whole signaling cascade where there's growth factor uh, overexpression of a lot of different things, VEGF, which I imagine you all are familiar with, but also carbonic anhydrase 9. So this is something that's kind of specific for kidney cancer based on the biology of kidney cancer, and specifically clear cell kidney cancer, the most common type. So um, this was an important trial that came out relatively recently where they were looking at this, this uh, compound, so gerontuximab, the antibody again, against CA9. Um, 
took about 200 patients with complete data uh, sites all over the US. And these were patients who were going to go to surgery for a renal mass. And what they did is in these patients, they did a PET CT with gerontuximab. And then they also did a contrast enhanced CT. And so what they were asking is, is the PET CT better than the regular CT? And their standard of truth then it was surgery. So in these trials, it's always important. You have to have some kind of gold standard. You're trying to, you're trying to say gerontuximab PET is better. Well, what's the, what's the gold standard that you're looking against? Um, so the sensitivity and specificity for clear cell kidney cancer was pretty good, 86%. So these mean um, kind of the confidence you can get for ruling in or out the diagnosis of, of clear cell kidney cancer, um, positive and negative predictive value. Um, so again, different ways of kind of looking at that were, were fairly good. The criticisms were, though, that these patients were actually not just patients with small renal masses, which is you know, what I think this could be used most for. Um, only 52%, so only about 100 of those had pretty small renal masses. 20% um, had really large renal masses where they would have just got a nephrectomy as standard of care. Um, other things that are important to note, and this is the case for a lot of PET compounds, so I just, I just mentioned this here. Um, all PET compounds are not the same. They have different features. They have different half-lives as far as how long they last in the body. They have different uh, technical specifications. So a scanner may be optimized for the most common type, FDG, but it may not do very well with, uh, with this gerontuximab. So there's really a trial needed in patients with small renal masses to kind of sort this out. And patients who are going to go, um, not just patients who are, who are uh, candidates for surgery. So I, I do want to show you a few pictures because I think this is pretty neat. So this is, this is a sample image. So um, thinking about what's the standard of truth or the gold standard, um, the patient had a one centimeter mass. It was clear cell kidney cancer on surgery. Um, and this is what it looked like on non-contrast CT. This is what it looked like on the gerontuximab PET. So it was, it was positive. This is what it looked like um, on a fusion. So in this case, uh, both the contrast enhanced CT uh, and the PET fusion would have picked this patient's, uh, this patient's kidney cancer up. Now contrast this with this scenario. So this is a patient with a 1.8 centimeter oncocytoma, so, so meaning a benign type of a tumor in the kidney uh, at nephrectomy. So, and my arrows, I realize, uh, have moved here. <laughs> but um, you see the mass there in, in the kidney seen on, on a contrast-enhanced CT. Um, and it would have been worrisome. It was positive, so, so worrisome based on contrast-enhanced CT. But on the PET CT, it did not uh, uptake the gerontuximab. So this may have, in this case, may have saved the patient from surgery. Now, in this case, of course, the patient did get surgery as the standard of truth. But in, in clinical care, this is a scenario where, where the gerontuximab might have been helpful. So scenario two, so what about surveilling patients who are high risk? Um, I'm not going to go through the evidence because I think that it, a lot of it's retrospective and not, a lot of it's not that great. But I'll just sum it up by saying that a lot of different guidelines, whether you want to look at the NCCN, um, the American Urologic Association, the European Uro Urologic Association, basically say that the, the role of PET for follow-up of RCC remains to be determined. And I think the main concern is, is false positives. So if, if you do a PET scan, you know, maybe it picks up some lung nodules that weren't otherwise seen, but maybe it makes you more worried about lung nodules that are nothing in the first place. Um, and, and that's the real concern, I think, there. So I'm going to move right into the, uh, the third kind of area where I think PET may be useful. And this is looking at response to therapy, so specifically tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So drugs like Sutent, drugs like Serafinib. Um, and so uh, these aren't meant to be read, but just to show you, there are at least seven trials that were summarized in a, in a NICE review that came out earlier this year. And what's key about these trials is each one of them had relatively few patients. The largest number of patients had, the largest uh, trial that is, had 44 patients, and they ranged down to having 10 patients. Um, and, and if you look, uh, most of the drugs studied either Sutan or Serafinib, sometimes a combination. Um, they had different timing. Uh, most of them were looking after one cycle of Sutan, so that usually about six weeks. But others looked at, at different time points. Um, 
And they did use mostly SUV Max, but some used, uh, some used some other features as well. So they were, in other words, these were a little bit heterogeneous. Small trials, different designs. So sometimes in, when that's the case, it's hard to draw firm conclusions. Um, so I'm just going to show you the, the very largest trial and, and just kind of talk about the top line results. So this was the one with 44 patients. These were previously untreated patients who had metastatic clear cell kidney cancer treated with Sutent. And what they did is they did this FDG PET imaging at baseline. They did an early time point at four weeks, and they did a late time at 16 weeks. And what they were really hoping to see is that uh, responses at either four weeks, so a, ch a change from baseline at four weeks or a change at from baseline at 16 weeks, would correlate with either overall survival or with progression-free survival. Um, and interestingly, uh, the response at four weeks did not correlate with any outcomes. But on the other hand, progression at 16 weeks did predict an inferior survival. Um, they also find a, f a finding that's been found in other trials, which is that a high SUV max at baseline, so a lot of uh, lighting up bright um, very intensely and number of pet positive lesions predicted for inferior survival. So um, I'm going to try to show you some more pictures because I think this, this makes it more interesting. So what you see here is a patient uh, who kind of falls into that camp. So a patient who at baseline had lesions, and you can see the little arrowheads uh, pointing out some different lesions. The patient had a response after four weeks of therapy, and then after 16 weeks of therapy had new lesions indicating progression. And then this is just picking out one lesion on a cross-sectional imaging, show it how, showing how it decreased in uptake from baseline to four weeks. Um, this slide isn't, isn't necessarily meant to be read, but just showing you kind of the, the differences and, and things that were shown in, in the different trials. Um, so in some trials, early assessment of response by FDG PET uh, could predict both progression-free survival and overall survival, whereas in that largest trial, it couldn't. Um, in one trial, trial, high baseline FDG PET uptake, so, so being really bright at baseline, seemed to indicate the disease was more aggressive. And then the last one is, is Dr. Rathmel and colleagues' trial. So this was looking at patients, interestingly, prior to, to kidney surgery or, or removing the primary tumor. And they did show that lower baseline uptake uh, were more likely to respond to serafinib, which was an interesting finding. That was in patients with clear cell kidney cancer, not in the non-clear cell subtypes. So um, in the next slide, one of the last slides, I'm just going to look toward the future. And, and I, we can make a list of you know, tens of hundreds of different pet tracers that have been looked at in cancer. Um, but these are a couple that I picked out that I think are interesting, just because they may or may not be specific to, to kidney cancer. Um, so one, if you remember back to that hallmarks of cancer diagram, one thing that may be unique to kidney cancer is this tumor hypoxia effect. And so they've looked at this compound um, that's usually abbreviated f miso or something else because it's unpronounceable. Um, and they showed that PFS, but not overall survival, was shorter in those who had more hypoxia, meaning low oxygen levels in the tumor, versus those who had higher oxygen levels. Uh, this is another uh, type of PET, so looking at, again, if you remember back to that hallmarks of cancer diagram, looking at tumor proliferation. And this is the group that I worked with at the University of Wisconsin, looking at basically a labeled thymidine, so, so a compound that's used in DNA synthesis. When cells are proliferating, they're needing a lot of this compound as kind of the raw materials, um, and so they're turning over a lot of this. Um, and so what, what we showed in this study is that we could characterize or quantify changes during SU10 exposure and during withdrawal. And so if you keep in mind, SU10 is given on a 4-2 schedule. So it's given for four weeks on, two weeks off. Um, we showed that VEGF is associated with that flare. And in an exploratory analysis, patients who had less clinical benefit appeared to have a large withdrawal flare. And so I'll show you a, a little picture of that. Um, so this, hopefully, you're able to see. But versus baseline, this patient had a decrease in intensity in this particular lesion. Um, from here to here, the patient had their planned two-week holiday of Sutent, which is in the, you know, the FDA-approved uh, uh, package. Um, and the patient had a large withdrawal flare. This patient did not do as well as patients who had less of a flare. So 
just indicating that this may be a tool to, to sort out or tease out biology and, and see how each tumor is acting. Um, so in conclusion, I, I would say that PET is very promising. I think um, though there's a lot, of be, a lot of work to be done. Gerontuximab, I think, it, it is important and may eventually play a role in management of small renal masses. FTG PET-CT, though, uh, really isn't a standard for surveillance after nephrectomy. Um, it may be, in the future, may be useful for evaluating response to targeted therapy, so drugs like Sutan, Phenator, so on and so forth. But I think we're still a long way from qualifying it as an actual biomarker uh, for response. And you know, lastly, I'd say there's lots of more room for research, new tracers, some of which I showed you, and new methods um, to, uh, to make things better for our patients and, and better help with management decisions. So thanks for your attention, and uh, happy to take any questions.